being an artist and a climate change activist. And why did I invite my computing students to attend and encourage the computer science club to co-sponsor? Well, the climate change needed my talents, and so I answered the call. I urge you to use your talents, whatever they may be, and answer the call to help save Mother Earth. Let us uh, join me in welcoming Al Grumet, an artist, climate activist, and the Associate Director of Artworks for Change. Based in Oakland, California, Artworks for Change is a nonprofit organization that creates contemporary art exhibitions and storytelling projects to address critical social and environmental issues. As Associate Director, Al manages an environmental leadership program that helps concerned citizens and emerging activists to find their place in the climate movement. The internship provides an introduction to climate policies, advocacy techniques, and the role of storytelling in promoting engagement. Through the program, per participants learn how to identify and cultivate their optimal pathways for climate activism and develop critical leadership and communication skills. I met Al about a year ago through a volunteer matching site. I was just a coder looking for a place to code, looking to volunteer to help the climate change movement, and I was matched with Artworks for Change. Together, we created a web-based game called Tipping Point, which you will get a preview of that in the event tonight. Without further ado, it is my pleasure now to turn this over to Al Grimet, self-professed lover of trees, plan to be inspired. Al, take it over. Thank you so much, Professor Banowski. It, uh, definitely connecting with you was a gift that keeps giving. So uh, thank you to all of you for, uh, for joining uh, me tonight for this conversation. I'm going to uh, share a brief presentation. So uh, Professor Banowski mentioned uh, storytelling. And uh, in, in connection with the work that I do as an artist and a curator uh, and environmental activist, storytelling uh, plays a very prominent role in, in what we do. And so today I'm going to share a story with you uh, told through uh, two different lenses. Uh, the first lens is, is uh, the lens of, of contemporary art, which is, is one of my favorite tools for, for telling a story. Uh, and then the second lens is, uh, is my own personal journey uh, to find my place in the climate movement. And my hope is that by sharing this story that, that I'll be able to inspire you to identify ways that you can align your interests and your passions with the work that needs to be done in the climate movement. I think many of us realize that, uh, that the number of concerned citizens is growing by the day, and that's a good thing. So now the challenge is how do we mobilize concerned citizens and take the action that needs to happen for us to, to get this climate crisis under control? <clears throat> so here's an introduction and an overview to, to my climate action journey. My journey began a few years ago when I decided to curate uh, a digital exhibition uh, for Artworks for Change. So this, this goes back to 2014. Uh, and we had uh, a bunch of traveling exhibitions. Uh, Randy Rosenberg, who founded the organization, um, produced a, a whole series of wonderful museum exhibitions that address social and environmental issues. And I wanted to do something complementary to that uh, that involved fewer logistics, uh, specifically sending artwork to uh, all, all parts of the globe. And so I decided to overhaul the website and, and launch what amounts to a virtual museum, which you can see at artworksforchange.org. Uh, and the exhibition that I uh, curated is called Footing the Bill, Art and Our Ecological Footprint. And in the process of uh, curating that exhibition, I became immersed in uh, a lot of artwork that addressed a whole range of environmental issues. And 
that level of immersion uh, uh, in these issues helped me learn to see. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what it means to learn to see when you're talking about the climate crisis. Then once you're immersed uh, in, in the environmental field for enough period of time, um, you tend to go into shock initially, but, but then you quickly need to pivot to learning how to solve the crisis because it is a crisis and, and there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, the good news is that there are a lot of solutions available and there's a mobilization uh, and solution pathway that's available to us. It, it's not on an unlimited time frame. It's on a fairly tight time frame and will require transformation of our society. But there is a path. There is a blueprint for solving this crisis. And then the final piece of the puzzle is, is once you see the lay of the land, you understand the nature of the crisis, and you understand the solution pathways, how do we find our own place in that so that we don't come out uh, running full speed and then uh, burn out well before we can make a contribution. We need to find uh, roles and tasks in the climate movement that are sustainable, that fit within our lives, that align uh, what we want to do, what we need to do uh, to lead fulfilling lives with the work that needs to be done. And so this is the, this is the picture that began to come together as I was working through uh, through this process. Um, I tend to like graphs when they are funny. <laughs> and there's not much about the climate crisis that's funny, but I, I like this graph uh, that, that really shows the essence of the problem, which is there are ordinary carbon cycles on this planet um, where carbon enters and exits the atmosphere. Uh, and there have been since life on earth began. Uh, but you can see uh, with that uh, marker for the Industrial Revolution uh, that what we did uh, in, in unleashing a fossil fuel-based uh, series of, of global economies is, is that we uh, unleashed uh, rampant emissions. And those rampant emissions are, are, uh, have quickly led to um, levels of greenhouse gases, in particular carbon dioxide and methane, in our atmosphere that are disrupting natural cycles and, and destabilizing our biosphere. Uh, we are currently uh, uh, at about 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we were down around 280 at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the line is, is still trending up despite all of what we know about the impacts of this. So when, once we understand that, that the release of the, these emissions into the atmosphere is, is going to have consequences, we have to learn how to process what those consequences will be. And, and I find that the artwork that I've encountered through my work is, uh, is an extraordinarily powerful way to inform people about, about this. So we're going to be dealing with heat waves uh, in this a uh, very poetic sculpture by the Glue Society. We see uh, an ice cream truck that looks like it's melted on the beach in, in Australia. Um, where I live, we're dealing with wildfires on an annual basis, and these are historically large and they, they last for a long time. And we wake up for weeks at a time with, with smoke in the air uh, and at times have had to pack up our belongings and to-go bags in anticipation of possibly having to evacuate our homes. Uh, in this work by Juliette Dumas, uh, she took a drawing and she set it on fire. Uh, and then with, with some thread, she set about the task of trying to sew, it, sew that drawing back together. Uh, and this is a really powerful metaphor for climate change because we assume that once we set these things in motion, that, that because of humanity's uh, great skill and technology and, and, and knowledge base, that, that we'll be able to put the pieces back together. But in fact, the, the exercise that Juliet went through with this artwork is, is probably closer to the truth, that, that once we un, un, destabilize our, our, uh, our atmosphere and our planet, that putting the pieces back to where they were 
is, is not going to be easy if, if possible at all. Um, climate change also unleashes droughts. Uh, again, where I live, this has become an all too common occurrence, uh, but droughts are spreading worldwide. Uh, they're, they're deeper, they, are, uh, they last longer, they're affecting agricultural production and, and people's ability to survive. Um, intense storms. In this artwork by uh, Jay of Yoshimoto, uh, I like his work because he, he always puts himself in the painting uh, as, as Godzilla, um, which I think is, uh, is, is a way of uh, kind of marking his territory and, and showing that even the most powerful creatures might, uh, might not be ready for what's to come. Uh, and here is a depiction of, of uh, a storm surge uh, in, in hitting the, the Brooklyn Bridge. And you know, as I, as I was going through this presentation, I'm, I'm just always amazed how many of these uh, climate events have happened in the very recent past. So uh, last year, massive storm flooding uh, across the Northeast. Uh, and so these types of storm surges and events are, are no longer tail events, they are they are um, becoming much more common, unfortunately. Uh, and all of these climate events add up to much more displacement uh, and, and migration and, and refugees from uh, the destruction of people's homes and, and as, as wildfires and floods and droughts make uh, living uh, a good life in particular areas untenable. We also need to learn to see beyond the horizon. There, there are a lot of things happening in the world that, that are not immediately visible to us. And, and one of those regions is the polar regions. Uh, Sebastian Copeland is a wonderful photographer. He's also a polar explorer. And change is happening most rapidly uh, on our planet in the polar regions. We're seeing uh, a, a large amount of, of melt, uh, of, uh, land ice with, with large ice shelves breaking off. Uh, we're seeing um, sea ice disappear at alarming levels, endangering wildlife such as polar bears uh, and adding to, uh, to the level of our seas. Uh, I particularly like this work by Alexis Rockman, uh, Manifest Destiny. It's, uh, it's a vision of the Brooklyn waterfront 200 years into the future. Um, unfortunately, we might get to this point sooner than 200 years, uh, but when he painted this, that's, that's what he was thinking, and uh, his background is particularly interesting. He, uh, he grew up in a household where his mother um, was, uh, was working at the Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, and he was uh, a budding painter and was interested in the Hudson, Hudson School of, of Landscape Painting. And so the influences of his mother's work uh, and, and his uh, Hudson School uh, inspired painting uh, coalesced into these beautiful epic paintings that, that depict uh, the, the natural world and, and human activity colliding. Also outside of our field of vision are, are things that are going on in the ocean. Um, the ocean is absorbing uh, much of the increase in, in global temperatures that has happened since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and unfortunately, that is uh, having very adverse effects on sea life, in particular, uh, coral reefs. Uh, and due to the rising temperature of the oceans, the uh, uh, additional amounts of carbon dioxide get dissolved in the seawater, leading to ocean acidification. And that also affects sea life and the oceans are uh, support the, the food supply for, for many people on the planet. As we continue with, with this journey of immersing ourselves in this information, um, throughout my journey, I, I came across some, some very interesting things that were happening behind the curtain. Um, and, and that story is best told by, by this artwork, 
uh, it's an artwork called Carbon Sink by an artist uh, named Chris Drury. And the, in this artwork, uh, what Chris Drury did is he took uh, pine tree logs from trees that had died from uh, beetle infestation, pine beetles. Uh, and the reason that these pine trees are dying from beetle infestations is that as the planet warms, the, uh, the beetles uh, can survive uh, at, at further points in the Northern hemisphere, uh, but the trees that are living there don't, haven't built up a natural resistance. So they die off and they die off pretty rapidly. And, and uh, Chris Drury uh, depicts that reality by uh, creating this, this vortex um, and in between the seams of those trees, he, he puts coal. Uh, and what's most interesting about this artwork is that it was installed at the, the University of Wyoming. Um, and on the board of the University of Wyoming uh, were uh, a number of um, industry leaders from the coal industry. And when they saw this artwork and, and the, the way that it was uh, conveying the connection between coal mining uh, and, and the combustion of coal and the death of the pine forests in Wyoming, um, they didn't really like that message. So they sent an edict out to the university to, to make this artwork disappear. And that's exactly what happened is that uh, uh, within a very short period of time, uh, this, this uh, sculptural environmental work was, um, was removed without a trace. Uh, and so, that is a representation of what we're dealing with in, in the broader battle to decarbonize our economy is that there, there's a lot of money invested in fossil fuel uh, combustion, fossil fuel extraction, uh, infrastructure, and, and those vested interests aren't going to uh, remove themselves from the process without uh, uh, doing some mischief on their way out. The other thing we need to do when we consider the, the climate crisis was we, we need to see the forest for the trees. Um, and what I mean about that is, is that th there's a lot of large numbers that we're dealing with because we're, we're talking about little actions that are taken on by the billions of people that live on the planet. And each of those little actions in isolation may not seem like profoundly damaging actions, but when we add them up, they translate into uh, a great degree of harm on the biosphere. Uh, in this work by Chris Jordan, um, he recreates a, a famous Seurat painting uh, with aluminum cans. And in that painting, uh, he uses images of 106,000 aluminum cans, which is the number used in the United States every 30 seconds. So we're dealing with really large numbers. And when you drink a can of Coke or Pepsi or Dr. Pepper, you're not thinking about the fact that you know, hundreds of millions of other people are doing the same and that the extraction uh, and processing of that aluminum is re releasing gases into the atmosphere that have tremendous warming potential and, and that the, uh, the mining of that aluminum is, is lead leaving eroded, damaged landscapes and unlivable uh, uh, places on the planet. And, and that's, that's one of the challenges of trying to get our head around a crisis that's driven by actions of all of us. So once we start to get our head around uh, these things, we want to start analyzing the problem so that we can begin to move towards solutions. And it starts by seeing the, the root causes of this problem. And, and in this work by uh, Jason DeCares Taylor, uh, he depicts uh, some bankers in this uh, uh, marine concrete sculpture that he placed on the, on the ocean floor. One of the nice things about this work is that uh, it, it reminds me of, of street art in a sense that you're, you're encountering something in a place you would never expect to. But what I like even more about it is that it's, it's regenerative. This, this work uh, ultimately becomes colonized by coral and other sea creatures uh, forming shelters and many ecosystems for uh, uh, life on the ocean floor. 
Uh, and so using his artwork, he's, he's able to regenerate habitats for, for threatened coral reef uh, creatures. But through his street art lens, he's, he's uh, getting to the root of the problem, which is that we approach uh, resources and natural environments as, as commodities. And the regulation of those commodities is insufficient to the point where uh, humanity is, is chronically overshooting the planet's resources. This is reflected in, in a variety of different ways. We, we have a depletive and extractive approach to our environments where we are uh, eliminating habitats in order to support our consumption, uh, as indicated by this uh, beautiful painting by oil painter Chester Arnold for deforestation and, and uh, coal mining in this uh, other painting called Holding Pond. And our architectural and transportation choices are also not indicative of uh, an intention to be around for the long term, because we are we are sacrificing large spaces of habitable land uh, for transportation infrastructure that is tying us into ways of life that cannot be sustained. Similarly, in this photograph by Ed Bertinsky, we see more sacrificial landscapes, uh, commoditizing fossil fuels and ultimately leaving behind unproductive land uh, that's, that's really not fit for much. Uh, I really love this artwork. Uh, it personalizes the, the waste streams. Um, Tim Noble and Sue Webster are, are artists from the UK and their medium is shadow art. Uh, and here they have put together uh, a, a sculptural installation that casts a shadow of themselves partying, but, but the, the shadow itself is cast by uh, waste from, from their own waste bins. Uh, and this kind of brings it home because uh, if, if you have any doubt that, that we're part of the problem, I would encourage you to do what's called a waste audit, where you simply um, take a, a look through your trash before you take it out to the curb uh, and just see what's in there. And then imagine how many years each element is going to be in the environment, in the landfill, because the, uh, the material that we send to the landfill, it doesn't go away. It just goes into someone else's backyard. And so if we are thinking about um, how we're approaching our, our waste streams and, and the way we're living our lives, uh, we would all find it strange if we took out our trash and buried it in our neighbor's yard. But in essence, that's what a landfill is. It just happens to be a neighbor that you, pro you don't know and a neighbor who probably doesn't have the economic means to push back on the fact that, uh, that these, these plastic and single use products are gonna be sitting in their yard for the next thousand years. We also have uh, an unsustainable approach to our food systems. Uh, in, in this artwork by Alexis Rockman, uh, we see uh, monocrops, monocrops like corn being grown to feed uh, factory farmed animals. It's a highly manipulated ecosystem that doesn't have the natural balance necessary to, to be restorative and regenerative. And as a result, by farming this way, over time, we are uh, polluting our atmosphere, polluting our waterways with chemical fertilizer uh, and, and leaving behind soil that's been depleted of nutrients and its ability to sequester uh, carbon and, uh, and other gases. Um, and some of the things that we're doing when we explain them out loud, they, they really sound odd. So one of the things that, that we do in uh, conventional, quote unquote, conventional farming is, is these days is that we genetically modify corn plants um, so that they can withstand greater amounts of insecticides and, and herbicides. And then we bomb them with uh, massive amounts of Roundup um, all in the name of getting greater yields. 
Um, but that sounds particularly perverse. And, and I don't think you're gonna see that on the labels at the supermarket when you are faced with a choice between organic food and conventional food. But unfortunately, that is the type of engineering and thought process that is going on behind the scenes. So once we, once we begin to see all of that and, and identify the roots of the problem, we also have to confront humanity's blind spots. Um, I love this, this work by Tsai Guo Kong, uh, a famous Chinese artist, uh, because it, it captures this boom and bust uh, cycles that, that define humanity. And unfortunately with, with the climate crisis, there, there's the potential for a boom or bust cycle that, that we won't recover from. And so it's important to look back on history and learn from the mistakes that we've made where we've come close to the precipice and, and not just launch ourselves headlong into uh, uh, the dangerous zones that we're quickly approaching. Another one of humanity's blind spots, which I referenced earlier, is, is this illusion of control. Uh, and I particularly like this artwork called Control Room by Lori Nix and Kathleen Gerber, because it, it comments on the illusion of control in, in a couple of clever ways. The first is, is the artwork itself. It, it looks like the photograph, uh, a photograph of an abandoned um, uh, control room. But in reality, what the artists do to create these artworks is they, they make uh, table-sized dioramas so this particular artwork is all constructed by hand and hand painted, uh, and then they photograph the work. So to me, that speaks to the illusion of control, which is the subject of the work. Um, the imagery itself also alludes to the illusion of control. We're, we're faced with a post-apocalyptic scene where clearly something has happened to, uh, to the humans that occupied this place uh, and the control room um, which was built with the best of intentions is now uh, abandoned and left to nature. The final piece of this is, is seeing the connections between all of this and, and pulling together all the pieces of this picture so that we see that it's actually humanity that is driving all of these changes to our natural systems and that despite the fact that we're all small actors on a large planet, then when, when we act in concert uh, and we're acting in concert in ways that pollute and disrupt uh, the natural systems, it really can have a profound effect. Um, and in this work, uh, it's, it's a particularly uh, profound way of communicating that. Uh, the artist Memo Actin from Turkey he uses machine learning and he trains it on images from Flickr. Uh, so the image to the right are, uh, is generated by uh, tens of thousands of images of ocean scenes from Flickr. And the image uh, on the left is uh, a live um, webcam feed. So in, in this context, the computer is taking what, it, what it's seeing, which is, uh, the uh, input from the web webcam and it's translating it into uh, what it knows and what it knows are these ocean scenes. So I'm gonna play this and put on the sound briefly. So here you can see it's a, it's a very powerful way of connecting small individual actions to something profound happening in the world. Uh, and later in this video, um, 
me see if I can jump ahead. Uh, he he uh, switches up to um, fire imagery where the webcam input is then being uh, translated into, uh, into fire imagery um, with a, in a reference to uh, the causation of, of fires. So a very powerful way of pulling all the pieces together and, and learning to see how what we're doing as a species is, is having profound impacts and putting us on a difficult path. So once we learn to see, uh, I think uh, we, we tend to develop a, a, a sense of urgency and, and want to, uh, to start taking action. Um, so true to form, I, I, I like the uh, comedic response to these uh, urgent challenges. So here you, you see the uh, solution proposed for flooding is, is to build an arc. Uh, but in some respects, we do kind of have to turn the clock back and learn from our ancestors if we're going to figure out how to live in a sustainable way uh, on, our, on our planet. Um, and as we start to learn about solutions, it's, it's critically important to get our head around a couple of key concepts. The, the first one is what are we shooting for and why? Uh, and so the, among the links in the chat, you will find uh, information about uh, an IPCC report uh, released in 2018. And the IPCC is a, a group of scientists organized by the UN uh, to uh, analyze climate change and uh, relay their uh, analysis and recommendations uh, to the world at large. And in essence, the, uh, the targets that come out of those reports focus on one and a half degrees centigrade increases and two degrees centigrade increases relative to pre-industrial uh, levels. Um, so that's somewhat of an abstract concept. Uh, and historically, uh, in recent times, scientists and politicians were steering us towards two degrees centigrade of warming. And so in, the, uh, in those links, you can learn more about what, what those targets mean as a practical matter for, uh, for life on Earth. And, and as just an example, uh, currently most scientists are, are having us target no more warming than one and a half degrees centigrade. We have already uh, warmed the planet by 1.1 degrees centigrade. So we don't have a lot of runway left. Um, and there's a, a, a dramatic difference between one and a half degrees centigrade of warming and two degrees centigrade warming. Uh, and the second link in the chat will, will refer you to an article that gets into some of that. But as an example, if we talk about the coral reefs, with one and a half centigrade uh, degrees centigrade of warming, uh, scientists expect that we will lose 70% of the coral reefs. Whereas with two degrees warming, uh, they estimate we will lose uh, pretty much 100% of the coral reefs. So we're talking about pretty dramatic differences. Uh, that's not to say one and a half degrees of warming is good because it's not. We're already seeing the impacts of, of a warming planet. Uh, but it's useful to, to get our head around collectively what, what types of, of controls we're looking to target. And when you look at uh, what the IPCC indicates is necessary to achieve these targets, you can see that by 2030, in order to be on a pathway to limiting warming to one and a half degrees centigrade, we have to cut emissions basically in half. So as you're thinking about what needs to be done, the, the collective work of the climate movement, that's your first milestone. We need to cut em global emissions in half by 2030. And then we need to get to net zero by 2050. And so that's basically what, uh, what activists and scientists talk about in terms of the, the types of targets that the climate movement is working towards. The good news is some of these scientists are also evaluating uh, climate solutions and reaching the conclusion that with 
the solutions that we have in hand, if we scale them, that those targets are achievable. They are achievable on the timelines that I set out. Uh, this project called Project Drawdown uh, lists the top 80 or so solutions to uh, climate change. And as I mentioned, these are all existing technologies. We're not waiting for some magic bullet to come out of a lab. These are things that we recognize and know. These are wind farms and, and solar farms and cutting food waste and switching to plant rich diets. These are all things that are familiar and all things that can be scaled. And this scenario two in this table on, under project drawdown, it tells you how many gigatons of carbon dioxide will be reduced if these solutions are scaled. Um, and scenario two is relates to the one and a half degree warming target. Scenario one, which I tend not to look at is for two degrees of warming. So you can see that there's massive potential for reducing carbon or, or drawdown from, from things that we know how to do. And to me, that gives me great hope. Uh, and it also encourages me to mobilize as many people as possible into all of the nooks and crannies of the climate movement. Um, as part of my work, I'm also an artist, and I decided to embark upon a series of artworks that um, conveyed the climate solutions that are described in Project Drawdown. So this is an artwork I created uh, for uh, utility scale solar farms, and this is one I created for wind farms. This is uh, an artwork about food waste, and this is uh, uh, an artwork about plant-based diets. This artwork on the left is about temperate forest restoration. And this one is about restoring and protecting uh, peatland. So these are bogs and that, that store a lot of carbon. And then with those um, artworks, I decided to uh, work uh, and launch a, a new project called Game Changers. And that's, that's how I, I came to connect with Professor Banowski and, and a whole team of really talented graphic designers and computer science students uh, and, and contributors of, of all, uh, all walks of life. And, and that's been a, a terrific project. And I I'm, I'm, would like to share uh, a couple of games that came out of this project because I think that they're really powerful storytelling tools. So here working with a, a, a college student named Candace Chen, um, we came up with a, a puzzle game uh, and I invite you to go into the chat and start playing this game. And I'm hopefully gonna be able to activate this link and, and show you how the game works. But in essence, it com combines a slot machine that serves up uh, tipping point graphics um, and puzzle pieces. So the, the puzzle that you're trying to solve is one or more uh, solutions from Project Drawdown. And you're trying to solve it before you get three of a kind of any tipping point. And these tipping points represent uh, points of no return uh, in our planetary system where we are uh, destabilizing the climate to points that uh, the changes are irreversible. So examples would be coral reefs dying off, the Amazon disappearing, uh, ice shelves uh, uh, collapsing and melting away. These are our so-called tipping points and we've incorporated seven tipping points into the game. Uh, and once you get into the game and you'll also find the link in the chat, you can see an explanation of the game um, in the chat and learn about the, those tipping points. So I'm gonna try to exit full screen here so that I can uh, play this game, but it just doesn't seem to be cooperating. Um, so maybe what we will do is, oh, there we go. Actually, I'm a little worried that it might not 
like the amount of bandwidth between the video and the gaming experience. So what I propose is maybe we will return to these games uh, at the conclusion of the, of the presentation uh, and, and continue with, uh, with the presentation so that uh, we don't get sidetracked too much by the games. But um, you'll see once you play the game and, and hopefully you have enough bandwidth to, to uh, uh, step out and, and play the game a little bit. You're gonna select an artwork from this drop down menu. Uh, and that's gonna be a solution from Project Drawdown. You're gonna select uh, a theme for, for the slot machine. And then you're gonna select uh, a set of music tracks. And when you launch the game, uh, you're gonna um, uh, activate a, a slot machine and you're gonna to need to drag and drop the puzzle pieces. And again, you're trying to uh, complete the climate puzzle before you reach three of a kind of any one of these seven tipping points. So it's a, a fun game and the, the message of the game is, is pretty clear. We need to come up with the climate solutions to address the crisis before we activate enough irreversible change that, uh, that the solutions will be too little too late. Okay, my apologies, I'm just trying to get back to um, the presentation. No, that's not working. I'm gonna stop sharing for one second. So once we have an inventory of solutions, we need to think about how we can implement those solutions as, as quickly as possible. And that's where policy uh, bridges come into play. Uh, by far the most impactful policy bridge is uh, a carbon tax. And when combined with a dividend of the tax revenues back to the public, this should be a foundational policy. Uh, and it's, it's really a policy that, that has a lot of intuitive appeal as well. It's, uh, it's almost universally supported by economists uh, as the most powerful tool that we have in our toolbox. And it's, it's quite straightforward to understand. Uh, currently in our economy, we subsidize fossil fuels. And when you subsidize things, uh, people use more of them. So the idea behind a carbon tax or a carbon fee is to reverse that. If you want people to stop smoking, you tax cigarettes. If you want them to stop using fossil fuels, you impose taxes on those fossil fuels. And with the revenue that you raise, if you re redistribute that revenue back to the public on a pro rata basis, what's going to happen is that uh, folks with lower and middle incomes will actually come out ahead because they are not the biggest fossil fuel and carbon users in the economy. Uh, they, they don't have large homes and multiple cars and lots of plane trips and, uh, uh, and, and lots of Amazon shipments. And as a result, the carbon tax is, is larger amounts of the tax are paid by, uh, by the wealthier members of the community. And when the revenues get distributed pro rata, the, the lower and middle income households actually wind up with cash in their pocket to more than offset for rising energy prices. But the other thing that happens is that the, uh, the, the new en renewable energy innovation gets a huge boost uh, because they are now playing on a level playing field. And a tax is, is a, a critical solution when people are polluting and, and taking uh, a free resource uh, that and imposing costs on other members of the community. So for example, if, if I'm a polluter today, I don't pay for the fire damage in California or the flood damage in New Jersey uh, or the, the impact of droughts uh, in, the, in the heartland. Uh, but with a carbon tax, we begin to internalize those pollution costs 
And if that carbon tax has a steadily rising schedule so that people see it coming and, and can react to it, uh, that is a powerful solution that will supercharge all of the other solutions that, that were laid out in Project Drawdown, in particular, any solutions that involve our energy systems and, uh, and innovation, carbon sequestration, all of that uh, great technological know-how will get a boost from uh, a very simple policy. Uh, in addition, you want subsidies for, uh, for innovation uh, in clean tech and carbon sequestration and a whole host of other areas uh, because the reverse is true. When you invest in those types of areas, uh, there are spillover benefits to others in the economy. So I encourage you to, to uh, look into uh, what's called carbon fee and dividend and similar climate policies. Uh, and in some of the uh, climate action boards that I'll share shortly, uh, you can find resources that can direct you to learn more about both Project Drawdown, the IPCC reports, and climate policies like the ones uh, I was just describing. We also have a, a game that we created through the Game Changers Project, where we took the tradi a traditional game of snake and we turned it into a metaphor for humanity's relationship for fossil fuels. And what was really great about this particular uh, game is that the, the metaphor was, was built into the original game. And if, for those of you who are familiar with the game of snake, uh, the snake goes around the game board uh, eating apples. And as, as it eats the apples, its tail gets longer. Uh, and it, it, the, the challenge of the game is to keep eating apples while trying to navigate the finite uh, geographic area of the game board. Uh, so for me, this was a perfect metaphor for climate change where we are consuming fossil fuels and have been since the industrial revolution. Uh, and those fossil fuels, as we consume them, we emit things into the atmosphere that destabilize our, our atmosphere and, and our way of life. And our ability to maneuver within the fixed constraints of our system becomes more and more difficult. Uh, so within this game, you will find these hazards like wildfire, flood, and drought that, that pop up once the parts per million rise above 400 parts per million where we are today. Uh, but you'll also find climate solutions like a carbon tax and subsidies and, and carbon dividends. And you'll also find uh, counterpoints to fossil fuels. These green apples and green apple pies, those are renewable energy sources. And when you consume those in the game, they don't lengthen the tail of the snake. So it's a fun game to, to play because as you play, you actually learn how to play sustainably. And that corresponds to how the types of choices we need to make to live sustainably. So that brings us to the final chapter of, of the journey, which is how do we find our place in the climate movement now that we've uh, identified the causes and the nature of the crisis and explored solutions? Um, so we came up with a bunch of tools and, and you'll see some of them in the chat. I really like uh, this, this Trello board approach where we load up a bunch of resources. This is my personal Trello board where um, I have my educational resources in this column and then all the actions that I take in my own home. Uh, and then all the groups that are working in my community to address climate change on the local level, working with uh, uh, residents of, of, of the neighborhoods, uh, working with the city, uh, and then national solutions. Uh, and what you'll see in the chat, I've posted uh, three different Trello boards. And uh, I, I invite the Environmental Club to, to contact me. I, I would be happy to come up with uh, a Trello board uh, in partnership with you guys to, uh, for your uh, CCM community. I think it's a really powerful way. And you'll see one of the Trello boards that I linked to uh, was a Trello board for a school. It happens to be my son's middle school. So what are the keys to success uh, in finding your place in the climate movement? The first is to align your climate work with your priorities and passions. Um, when I was uh, setting about finding my place in the climate movement, I was always torn. How do, I, 
how do I keep doing what I enjoy, making art and, and telling stories and, and curating exhibitions? How do I put those interests and passions to work in the climate movement? Um, hopefully from, from what I've shared today with, of my journey, you can see that I'm, I'm working hard on that path to, to align those interests. And you, you've heard from Professor Bernowski how she was able to combine her interest in computer science and, and game design and, and coding with, with a project that is meant to reach communities and communicate important information about climate change. The other thing you need to do is, is be a contributor. You need to look at the skills that you have, the resources that you have, the networks, the organizations that you're a part of as assets. And you need to figure out how can I put those skills and resources and assets to work in, in directly in promoting the, the climate movement. Be an influencer, leverage those networks and platforms. If you're a member of an organization or a community, use whatever platforms you have to influence others, whether you're talking about household level action or advocating for policy at the national level. You can get support from a coach. If you want to email me, uh, I'm happy to uh, connect you with, uh, with someone in our program to, uh, as part of the environmental internship that, uh, that Professor Bernowski referenced. Um, I do a lot of coaching. Uh, and, and what I found is that with very little encouragement, people can get activated and hit the ground running uh, and find it to be a very fulfilling uh, experience. Another tip that I have is to explore proven paths. Um, and what do proven paths look like? Well, in your community, it, it looks like joining an existing group. So you have an environmental club, you can join that club and get involved in the activities of that club. You can connect with a local grassroots environmental group uh, in your area where you live. You can get involved with a youth led chapter of a national organization. Getting involved with existing groups means that you have a social network uh, and support, and it's, it's a really great way of hitting the ground running. You can also be a leader. You can advocate for change at school, uh, in your workplace, or in any organization uh, in which you participate. You can organize an event, whether it's a presentation like the one you're hearing today or a rally or a petition or a letter writing campaign, pretty easy to organize. And there are any number of issues where uh, doing that type of work would, would be really additive to the movement. Advocate for a policy. Um, when when we're, we're in the process of pushing for a carbon fee and dividend, I've, I've written uh, emails to my senators, I've written emails to my family and everyone I've had have connections with to do the same. That's what advocacy looks like. It's, it's harnessing and mobilizing uh, all of the voices in our democracy to push for the, the changes and policies that are urgently needed. You can pursue a career track in a sustainability field. There are wonderful websites like climatebase.org where you can see some amazing jobs in, in sustainability, whether it's in emerging technologies uh, or, or uh, public health. There are a, a, a large and growing selection of, of careers that are driven by sustainability and climate change. And then finally, analyze your own life through the lens of sustainability. Um, there are lots of guides that are in those Trello boards that I shared. Uh, and, and a good way to, to feel good about accomplishing something is just to get started with some small changes in your own life, whether it's meatless Mondays or making your next vehicle purchase, an electric vehicle, or uh, transforming some of your commutes to biking commutes. These are changes that will enhance your life and will advance uh, the, the climate movement. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over for, for next steps. As I mentioned, uh, I, I welcome anybody to contact me uh, with the email that I provided in the presentation. Uh, I also uh, welcome you to uh, check out the Trello boards and other resources. Um, you should receive a, a link in the, in the chat 
uh, to a document that has all of the links that I referenced and shared during this presentation. Uh, and, and then perhaps we can partner together with the Environmental Club and, and have a next phase of, of, this, uh, of this journey together. Thank you very much. I know we're a little over eight, but we were hoping if it's okay with you out to ask a couple of questions perhaps. Absolutely. All right, so just a reminder for anyone who is in the audience, there are two ways you can ask your questions. So start thinking about those questions. I know uh, some comments and questions are already coming in, uh, but you can either type your question directly in the chat box and I will ask that question for you. Or if you want to ask the question, just type the word question in the chat box. We'll give everyone about 30 seconds to start writing in some questions. And in the meantime, I will just say that we had a comment to you, Al, that came in for uh, to me that said, they don't have a question. They just wanted to say thank you for using your talent to bring awareness to the problems that we are causing intentionally or unintentionally. I feel inspired. I will find a way to use my talent to participate in the healing of our home. Mother Earth needs us all. So I thought that was a great comment to share. Yes, thank you. All right, so I have a question that came in. If uh, science helps us understand and define climate change, is it a fair statement to say that artists, game designers, computer science students, et cetera, have a role to play in developing a solution? This appears to not be the sole domain of climate scientists. Well, I think that that's a, a very good insight. And, and when I describe the type of work that we do, I often put scientists in the same category as, as artists in the following, artists and designers in the following way. Um, from, from my experience with the climate movement, what I've observed is that you have a lot of passionate people and their first attempt to use their talents to make a difference involves creating something that they put out into the world, hoping that it will inspire people to, uh, to take action. Um, the challenge is that a lot of these efforts, whether it's uh, a scientific report uh, or an artwork or a game, is that they wind up being isolated or stranded efforts. And so part of the evolution of our approach at Artworks for Change and my approach as a, as a climate activist is to move beyond these isolated stranded efforts and to connect the efforts with, uh, with the types of actions that have measurable impact. So in my view, it's not enough to use those talents to inspire people if we don't offer our hand and lead them to the organizations that are, are doing the work on the ground and the campaigns that are uh, advocating for policy changes that are critically needed. It's not enough to elevate concern because at this point, uh, studies indicate that 70% of the population is concerned about climate change. So manufacturing concern at this point is not our top priority. Our top priority should be mobilizing concerned citizens in productive ways. And I think that just as scientists have a role in, in that through things like Project Drawdown and all these great nonprofits that are doing uh, great work and, and technological innovation, so can artists and game designers and storytellers lead people to the actions and the groups and the activism that is actually going to uh, have measurable impact. Thank you for that. Um, another, I have two more questions here. One's a general question. So would this, the, the links that you shared, um, is that just for people in the audience today or is it okay for some to share with, um, share more publicly on social media for more to learn? So I, I think as Professor Banowski will attest to, um, the spirit of our organization is very much about being an open source provider of templates, information, tools, and capacity building, and inviting the community to take that and make that their own. So uh, the, the tipping point game that, that we shared today 
uh, is, is designed in a way where we can um, share it with groups that can produce their own artworks that can then be imported for, uh, for the puzzle game. And those games have actually been used by uh, uh, three different sets of high school students who have led environmental events at their school where they have developed their own Trello boards and developed, use their own artwork in the games. So these are tools that are meant to be embraced and, and spread so that we can multiply the impact. So thank you for the question. And by all means, please go out into the world with this information and activate as many people as you can. Great, I'll have one final question for you. Um, it says, as a student, I am still learning. How do you feel that you evolve? I am a bit nervous that I'm behind on my knowledge or finding my place. That is a very, very common part of the journey. And it's one that, that there's no, no shortcut, right? So you should just assume that your first endeavors are, are perhaps going to be misplaced or, or won't represent the optimal potential return on your talents, that doesn't matter. What matters is starting. What matters is getting connected with groups and people and adding to the social dimension of climate action and, and just moving uh, as many people as you can into the general direction. Um, I, I heard it expressed very well by a, a zero waste person. Uh, and and what, what she said is that if everyone was, per, uh, if, if the only people who could be involved as uh, zero waste activists were the ones who, who had a zero footprint, then we would have something like 10 activists. <laughs> and so we can't set a bar for ourselves that that excludes the, the vast majority of us from the climate movement. We all need to do what we can when we can. There are gonna be parts in our lives, times in our lives when we can't dedicate much time to the climate movement uh, and that's okay. There are gonna be times in our lives where we think we're doing the right thing but then we later learn that, you know, we took a few wrong turns along the way. That's perfectly fine. It's all part of the journey. The key is getting in motion, learning as much as you can, and connecting with others so that you can support them and they can support you through that journey. And I will add to that that, that there were plenty of screw ups along the way as, as I was trying to uh, learn how to be an effective at activist. And on all the things I highlight as, as steps to be avoided, I'm highlighting them because they were mistakes that I made along the way. Thank you for answering all of our questions. Before we close this evening, I'm just going to hand it over to Professor Nancy Banowski, who wants to share something quickly with everyone. So Al, as Al was encouraging us to continue the momentum, um, let's see, is that any, no, you can't even see my screen. Um, anyway, uh, we are taught, we've been talking about getting a game changer event planned at CCM for Earth Day, uh, if we can time it right. So if you are interested in helping organizing that event, please contact me at my email address shown here. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And behalf of the County College of Morris, the Legacy Project Ambassadors Program, as well as our co-sponsors, thank you Al for joining us, sharing all of your experiences with us. It was really, really a wonderful event. And I can only speak to myself as a environmental science professor, that this was so wonderful. And so many of my students, I just have to tell you, were commenting that this was so wonderful to watch or be a part of my lectures and then have a completely different lens that you brought and seeing the images. So thank you from all of us. Hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>